get water out of a dry. I'm not worried about the exchange rate that the should be. Because your salary should be in that. Eh? And you are not an importer. Maybe that is even teaching us a lesson. To be dependent on our domestic. Alright. Does this man look like somebody who is ready to make Nigeria work? Does this man look like somebody who will be ready to make sacrifices to make sure Nigeria becomes a better country? Absolutely no. This man is not ready for anything and he did not prepare for anything good for Nigeria. For somebody who wants to become a president, pray inform Nigerians that he is not interested about the Dondari. After his um, government, I'm talking about the APC government, promised Nigeria that one donor will become one naira. And what happens? Today, he is now the president on the seat, even though he's not going to stay there permanent. But what is going on? One donor is heading to 1,000 naira. This is the situation we have found ourselves. But you know what? Let us watch what Mr. Pitobi said about this situation. I'm against borrowing for consumption. Okay. Let's be more analytical in this. We have borrowed in Nigeria from 2000, call it from 2008 to date, we've been able to borrow where our debts have now increased to almost $100 billion. Ruben, what can we show for all these debts? And to show you that the debt was reckless and for consumption, it never impacted on our growth. It's a simple thing. Ruben is a very simple thing. Ghana is borrowing. Kenya is borrowing. Every other country, let me not go far. In 2010, Ruben, the GDP of Ghana, Ghana, is $32 billion. $32 billion. This is, this is Ghana. $22, $32 billion. Their per capita income, as at that time, is one, I repeat, it's 1,300 Ghana. In 2019, Ghana GDP is $64.5 billion. Their per capita is 2,200. So within this period, their economy have doubled, their GDP has doubled. In Kenya, it's a similar situation. Kenya have moved from 40 something billion dollars to 87. Their GDP have moved from 900, and their per capita have moved from 950 to 1,700. That is a country. In our own case, as of 2010, uh, when we started reckoning all this borrowing, our per capita was 2,300. Today is 1,920. So something is missing. We are, we're borrowing money. The more we borrow, the worse our economy, which means we're not investing this money. When you borrow for consumption, you're hurting the economy more. I'm not against borrowing. But let's have a business case where we must borrow money. Let's have a convincing situation. You don't just get up in the morning and be borrowing money anyhow. So if they want to borrow, please, please, let's have a business case. Why we must borrow. Let's know how. And again, I'm totally against borrowing in foreign currency. I recall when they said they're going to borrow in foreign currency because they found it cheaper. No, it is not cheaper. When you're borrowing in foreign currency, a currency you're not in control of, a currency which you, you, you're earning, in it is almost what you can talk, call precarious. You don't know whether you're going to get it or not. If, for example, today you devalue, and Ada moves from 305 to about 400, you've added 25% on the value of the external debt you're owing. And if you look at it, it's very easy. From 2015, in 2015, our entire debt stock was just about $2 trillion. Today is about seven trillion. If you convert it to naira, so it is yes, you can be going to borrow cheap money, but you're borrowing a currency you're not in control of, and it's a crisis. So for me, it is not borrowing that is the problem; 
is what you're borrowing for. What is the business case for his repayment? And then again, as you're borrowing, have you tried to cut down on your expenses? I've said repeatedly that cost of governance in Nigeria is too high. It's time for all of us to remove all these long robes, all these sorts of things that we're wearing and doing this that is costing us a lot and start functioning like every other country. Well, you see, the economy has been in a, in a very difficult It's been in a very difficult time by a combination of so many factors. As you know, not just closure of border. We don't, we don't have, today, our FDI have gone down below what is expected and everything. Our economy is being affected by number one thing that is in our economy today is insecurity. Because with insecurity, you don't have even locals investing. You don't have, of course, foreign direct investment coming in. I was in a meeting two weeks ago with a group in the city in London. And what came out would be shocking. They said to me, Peter, nobody's talking about Nigeria now. Nigeria have two things which investors run for. And those two things are insecurity and lawlessness. And even as the Nigerian, as they're saying it, I can feel it. And this is so bad that I can give you the situation we found ourselves using 2018 position. In 2018, for the first time, Nigeria was not among the best in terms of no amount of receipts of FDI. I just used three countries to show you how bad it is. If you look at Egypt, which is supposed to be number three in the economy in Africa, Egypt has a population of 97 million. Their FDI was 7.9 billion. South Africa, with 58 million, their FDI was 5.3 billion. Morocco, with about 27 million, their FDI was about 3.8. If you put these three countries together, you're barely getting about 190 million in population, and their FDI was 17 billion. Nigeria, with 200 million, our FDI was 1.9. In fact, if you add Ghana, Ghana and neighbor got 3.5, and Ghana is just 29 million. So if you add Ghana there, you have about 220 million, which is about the population of Nigeria. 220 million and 200 million is just 10%. So if you add Ghana, the three, four of them wrecked $20.5 billion. Nigeria could not make, with 200 million, could not bring in 10% of that. That is how bad it is because of insecurity and lawlessness. And what is even worse, we, people like me, the political leaders, are not even seeing that we're in crisis and behaving and conducting ourselves as if we're in crisis. We're still moving our, our, around with our long ropes, long convoys, moving as normal, having all sorts of uh, parties and everything, as if things are normal. At the time, we were supposed to wear our shirts and coats and face the reality that we found ourselves and see how we're going to. You have millions of people with this thing happening. How are you going to now create jobs for millions of unemployed youths? We have almost 60% youth unemployment. And nobody's panicking. So it's a crisis. 